y'all are ready, we could jump in. Yay. Sweet. Okay. Um, thank you so much for having me here. My name is Nils Paulson. Uh, I'm here mostly today in the capacity of being a community uh, organizer and communications director of Transition US, which I'll talk all about today. Um, so this is all about the global future and the Transition Towns movement uh, toward community resilience. Um, I'll show a slide at the very end with some resources, but I did write some websites up on top, Transition US stuff, and then my personal uh, info. Um, and before I jump in too much, I just want to acknowledge everyone not to be like too woo in California here, but just to say like, you're sharing your sacred time with me, and I really appreciate it. So I want to like actually just thank you and salute you for sharing time and space with me. Um, and then just a little kind of cheerful disclaimer about what I share, and that, you know, while I am working with a nonprofit, uh, whatever, like, what I'm saying today is just one person, one schmo, and that everybody out there, I would say, like to treat it with this like kind of grain of salt levity that like, you know, everybody out there is just one schmo, one person, one drop in the sea. And so if something sticks and works for you, awesome. If things don't work for you, that's cool too. Just uh, take it or leave it. And uh, I also like hold space at the end for any kind of questions or comments, and I want to uh, hear from you all as well. Um, so. I'm going to talk about the Transition Towns movement, uh, community resilience, permaculture, I'm kind of still figuring this little thing out. Um, but first, oh, I just want to get a quick, uh, quick uh, sense of the room. Uh, could I just see, like, if you feel already like the system is in need of some change and, like, you know, we need to be doing things a little bit differently, could I see, like, one hand? And if you're, like, all in for, like, the big change, like, like ready to really seriously get to work. Okay, so I... I see a lot of two hands up for a lot of people, so that's fantastic. Um, I'm like that too. And then I also want to say that I'm, I'm kind of framing this within my own story of how I kind of came to this work. And everybody's got their own lineage. You each have your own sort of, you know, peak moments and difficult moments and specific lineage, mentors, teachers, challenges that brought you to this place in your life. So I want to acknowledge everybody's story. You know, how did you get here? And to really honor that as well. Um, so for my part, uh, I came from San Francisco and grew up in Pacifica. In high school, I was censored uh, for writing a, an article in the school paper. And I came back and ran uh, uh, an underground newspaper. And that was like a big part of my sort of lineage and my awakening process. Um, it was also during the Iraq war years. I ended up moving uh, to New York to go to New York University. And I was also blessed in yeah, New York City. I was blessed to be able to do a lot of traveling as well. And to young people of all ages, I would say, travel. Like, if you get the opportunity to experience different cultures, that can go a long way to, like, really, you know, unplug a person. And so I was blessed. This is a photo from Cairo, Egypt, pictures from uh, the southern tip of South Africa, and obviously uh, Venice and some other places I was blessed to go, the western desert. Uh, my, I have family. This is my father and my stepsister, Lulu, here from, uh, from China. So I got to travel to Asia, which was really nice. Um, and I noticed a few themes recurring wherever I traveled, and one is that people are people. Whatever color, religion, language, everyone out there is trying to, you know, feed their family, trying to have fun, play soccer, whatever. Like, the world is full of awesome people who are just trying to be awesome. Um, another thing that I noticed wherever I went is there's all these fires burning. And we may not think of it like that when we're driving in a car, which, you know, I'm like not to be a hypocrite, but yeah, I do drive, even though I'm like part of this environmental movement. And like, I do flip on a light and my place where I rent is not solar powered. And I really like, I recognize I'm a part of this. But when you zoom out and look at this entire world, where there's fires burning everywhere. All these little lights, like it's coming from fires burning somewhere. And the fire is, is creating obviously uh, an environmental crisis. So, you know, in short, and then I also noticed that we're tiny. My dad used to say that, and he was an astrophysicist, he said that we are a gnat on the ass of a cosmic elephant, you know? That like, we're actually a speck of dust on a gnat on the ass of an elephant. And as Martin Luther King so uh, frequently returned in all of, all of Dr. King's teachings, and he's like been a, a great mentor in my lineage, but he would constantly returned us to this, this bottom line that all life is interconnected and interrelated. And that, you know, injustice to one is injustice to all. And that we are tied into a single garment of destiny, you know. So whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. And we're somehow all in this together. Um, as I kind of, after college, started eking out my little uh, 
place in the in this struggle as a peaceful revolutionary. Some teachings really hit home with me. One was blessed unrest by Paul Hawkins. Was that part of your curriculum in this class? Mm -hmm. Really? Okay. I, so I love Blessed Unrest. That was like a huge awakening moment for me, noticing that this movement of movements is everywhere. And whether it's, you know, an organization representing women's rights or, you know, children's health or labor and fair pay or, you know, working to combat the climate crisis, like the movement of movements is everywhere. And we can't even, we can't even really measure how huge it is. Uh, and then also Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States. Anyone out there worked with Zinn? Yeah, so, I mean, if you haven't read this, I mean, it's, it's pretty dense. You can get it as an audio book, but the, the idea that history is not the, the history of the conquerors that we've been taught, but it's the history of, again, the women, the history of the people of color, the history of the indigenous people, like, that's a way to look at history, and it, it's really empowering to see that history is uh, something that's of, of the people and shared. Oh, so yeah, some of my teachers, Asada Shakur, Malcolm X, John Lennon, this is my lineage. You have your own special teachers that have impacted you, and I just like to sort of, you know, pay homage to, to those in, on my path. Um, I went to, after college, the U.S. Social Forum in Atlanta in 2007, and I, there's all kinds of these, these, organ, these, these events that take place around the country, like the Democracy C Convention and the People's Summit. So I went to the U.S. Social Forum, the first one in Atlanta. It was kind of like a, the Social Forum is a response, the people's response to this thing called, if you've heard of it, the World Economic Forum. And that's like where the World Bank, IMF, kind of like governments, you know, mostly like imperial governments of the world come and like in there, I'm sorry, I'm like wearing like the outfit of the oppressor right now, but you know, that's for a reason I'll get into in a minute. Um, but you know, the, the suits, mostly like the white men in suits, show up and like draw the lines and make the economic policies that are gonna affect the entire world. So the social forum was like the people's movement response to this, and the world social forum will happen every couple of years and usually somewhere in the southern hemisphere, and the, the movement comes together to like organize ourselves. So we started having the US social forum, and I went to it in 2007 and realized that I wasn't crazy for thinking that we needed some big change, and I was feeling like very like isolated and frustrated, and that was like, this was my business card at the time, you know, like this revolution fist. And uh, I found that, well, this, I'm, definitely part of a huge movement here. It's amazing. Um, and I was living in Harlem, and I got the call one day that my pops was in back here in California was sick with leukemia. So I came back to be with him, and that was, that was my visit with the angel of death. This was actually after he died, kind of going through his, uh, his papers, and um, that's my dad right there, and me looking up to him when he was a kid. That is uh, not Gatorade, it's urine from a person going through chemotherapy. And they're like, fill your body with chemicals that are gonna like kill the cancer and obviously like kills your, wipes out your immune system as well. So that was a really powerful teaching. Um, working with the angel of death, uh, a saying from Gautama Buddha, when I ended up kind of like going down this path of spiritual studies around this time. I grew up like a scientist, atheist, and I read Gandhi's biography, and you know, the idea that God is truth. And he directed me to some of these other teachings and I started reading Buddhist texts and this one hit home for me that of all footprints, that of elephant is supreme. Of all mindfulness meditations, that on death is supreme. Essentially that if you consider your mortality, that like, sorry, the, my Debbie Downer moment of the day is that we're all gonna die and we don't even know when. Uh, but if we consider that, that actually get, gets us closer to life itself and to the essence and how like amazing this moment is. And you know, what if, if your end were to come tomorrow or next year, what would it be like? Well, how would you live your life right now? Um, after Pops died and he was, he, we, I, I was face to face with the for-profit medical uh, healthcare system and my Pops died in thousands of dollars of medical debt uh, and also was unable to get some treatments that he needed because he didn't have the money for it. Um, but we lost our family home after that, and I was just myself and my sweetheart at the time traveling the country. We went to, um, to Minneapolis to march on the Republican National Convention. Again, this is my lineage, so like lineage check. Like, what's your story? And like, I invite you to like play with your story and honor your story as you continue your path. Um, I came back, I was just like working a job to pay the bills, but also continuing to feel like something seriously big needed to happen. And I didn't know where to start. I didn't know where to begin. But I knew I had to figure out a way and lean into it. And it actually started with my own healing. Actually, I went to, ended up going to a uh, massage and holistic healing school. And uh, this is like, I traveled to Peru and did some like deep inner searching. And I ended up moving to the mountains of Lake County, 
Anybody, anybody folks know Lake County? Right over the hill here to the north, yeah. I moved up there uh, for the fresh water, for the, you know, the trees, and I thought I was gonna be alone and found myself surrounded by community and embracing community. And that's kind of what led me to this whole Transition Towns movement, which I'll, I'll speak of in just a moment. Um, some more shots from Peru, this was like leaving my, the last of my dad's ashes behind by Machu Picchu. Um, oh yeah, so I moved to Lake County and I started finding that people like cared about each other, like neighbors in a way that I'd never really experienced before. And also people were coming together around the stuff of life, like local water and food and ed education. And uh, I started like just meeting my neighbors and go, I went to like a monthly documentary screening and I found out the next U.S. Social Forum was coming up, this time in Detroit. And so I planned to go to this U.S. Social Forum. And before I went, I announced it to my community, like the folks who went to this monthly documentary screening, the kind of like activists in town. I was like, yo, I'm going to Detroit. And this elder sister came up to me and like grabbed me by the shoulders. She was like, Nils, you gotta find out about transition towns. You gotta find out about permaculture. And I'd never heard of either of those words before. So I went to Detroit. And where in 2007 at the Social Forum in Atlanta, it was reflecting back my state of like angst and unease and like revolutionary frustration, which is still a, an important part of my soul. But when I went to Detroit in 2010, it was reflecting something slightly different. And it was that if we want to change the world, we first must begin within with self-transformation and then begin locally with our communities. And I learned all about this transition towns movement, which, you know, in addition to the revolution work of, cha you know, changing the system or the reform work of like making some tweaks to the system and like lobbying, changing, you know, government and electing new officials. There's also this prefigurative work of just building a better system on the ground right here in our town at our university. Are we recycling here? Where's our, what's happening when we flush our toilets? Where's our water going? Where, where's my food coming from? What am I putting in my body? Do I know my neighbors? It's a very, like some of these very basic things. And if we could create uh, local food security in our communities where everybody has access to, to healthy local food. If we could create clean, healthy watersheds, a strong local economy where we're keeping dollars local. Like we don't need political change to do this. This is all within our realm of capacity. So I started learning about the Transition Towns movement. Um, a quick moment of permaculture. Are you, is it, when I say permaculture, am I speaking another language or do you have a sense of, okay, cool, far out. I'm right there with you. I mean, I'm still learning about all this. But permaculture uh, has become a really important part of my, my world these last, uh, you know, several years. And it comes from jamming together the words permanent and agriculture or permanent and culture uh, to create a system that is sustainable. A pr I, I, you know, like, you know, a lot of spiritual teachers might say that nothing is permanent, and I might tend to agree. But as permanent as we can make it, like, can we create homesteads, communities, towns, even maybe a world that's like not outstripping itself of its resources and its carrying capacity. Can we create uh, a homestead or a farm that is harmoniously integrating landscape and people, essentially working with and within nature instead of trying to conquer it and work against it? You know, seeing ourselves as part of, like, we're part of the world. We're part of this natural ecosystem. So uh, permaculture is based in these three core ethics, care for the earth, care for people, Returning the surplus, or fair share. Uh, wouldn't it be great if that was also our, our, you know, the things that guided our government and our, and our ways of getting down in community? But uh, it, it's, it's applying a lot of these principles of observing how nature is working and finding ways to work with it. And like observing the interactions of the parts and getting things to interact better. It's conscious, holistic design. Kind of like think of it as like holistic health instead of like just trying to diagnose something and treat the symptom what if we considered the whole being, and this is like considering the whole, you know, the whole landscape, the whole community. So permaculture is something I definitely like, you know, invite you to play with. You can YouTube permaculture and find all kinds of crazy solutions. Everything from, well, we'll get into it, all the solutions. And a lot of it is working with nature. The idea of like, you know, patterning things off of nature, biomimicry. We notice certain patterns that exist in nature. And if we design with some of these natural patterns in mind, a lot of the output becomes much greater. Instead of, for example, monocropping and trying to grow one crop over many acres of land and needing to use uh, all these artificial harmful pesticides that cause cancer and you know, having to use 
uh, fossil fuel based uh, petroleum fertilizers that are you know not good for the planet or for our health we could be designing these lush landscapes this is like a classic food forest where you actually can design a landscape that grows into a self-sustaining forest that's providing all sorts of different food and some plants are there to attract beneficial insects some plants are there to fix nitrogen into the soil so that it can deliver it and it's like you're feeding the mycelial network you're, there's a saying that you know a, a, a poor farmer makes weeds a mediocre farmer makes crops a smart farmer makes soil. So it's like it's all about building up the soil and like creating a context for thriving. Permaculture is not just growing food and landscapes, it's also, you know, it's, it's lived on the personal level, it's lived on the local level, regional level, and it considers things like livelihood and justice and community and, you know, all the, all the human needs that we have and all the, the needs of the other beings that we share this world with. And that kind of brings us to transition. Um, and did you guys have like a primer on transition at all? Did you like get to read about that during this class? Okay, great, so I'm getting to download. And is, it, is this, am I right that this is the last day of your semester? Awesome, congratulations. I feel like super honored to be here on the last day. Um, hopefully this will like send, up, send us off in a way that's not a downer because like the world has some crazy stuff going down in it and like scary things with what's going on with climate change and you know, nuclear challenges and uh, we're in an interesting time, and it could be scary, but there's also a wealth of amazing community solutions right now. And I, I feel like this transition movement is one of them. So it, it, the idea was taking this permaculture stuff, you know, like, and applying it not just to our landscape, but to our community. So there was a permaculture teacher in Kinsale, Ireland. His name was Rob Hopkins. His name should be out here somewhere. He edited this thing. Um, he had a permaculture class and he assigned the students to go do their final project and the students said what if instead of designing a landscape what if we applied permaculture to our entire town and this the class was very aware of peak oil uh, climate change economic instability that like we have histories of great economic depressions and uh, it's not necessarily a stable system that we're working in like for the majority of human existence or existence on earth and this line to this flat line can continue all the way back to our you know primordial ancestors who were not burning massive amounts of fossil fuels and then all of a sudden industrial revolution psh, we started burning all this stuff really quickly and we've devastated the environment and also we've burned through a lot of the stuff and it's not always necessarily going to be like that and what if we instead of just being uh, this future happening to us what if we consciously decided to step down? What if we consciously decided to regulate how much fossil fuels we're burning? What if we consciously decided to like transform our communities so that we're not like living this extractive, you know, patriarchal capitalist model, but we're actually reconnecting with each other at a community level? So these students came up with this energy descent plan for their town of Kinsale, Ireland, and the city council adopted it. And the transition movement, Rob was like, oh, this is, there's something here. And so he wrote this oh, transition handbook. I'll come back to this in a second. It's all about resilience. And if you've heard the word resilience, it's kind of like become a buzzword now, but it's really all about the ability to bounce back. And if something shocking happens, like the fires that ha happened here in October, like it's the ability to bounce back from that shock. It could be a personal thing that we're bouncing back from. It could be a communal shock. It could be a, you know, a, a spike in the price of fossil fuels that makes it really difficult to get materials. And then it could be a natural disaster where the truck literally stops coming over the hill to deliver all these things that come from China. So what are we going to do if things change? And how along the way, while building resilience, can we also make a community that's more awesome in general? Like we're not just like preparing ourselves for the apocalypse, we're actually like creating lives that are more socially connected and enhanced, not just like in our own private boxes looking at our private screens, but we're like coming together in community and hanging out and doing cool projects that, you know, clean up the land and take care of things like public safety and, you know, sharing resources and building community and local arts and entertainment and all of that. So I started learning about this stuff. I found the transition handbook. Uh, this was like the Rob Hopkins' first primer on the transition movement, um, dealing with these sort of whys of peak, peak oil, climate change, economic uncertainty. Did you guys see the story of stuff? Was that part of your curriculum in this class? Amazing YouTube series of like short videos, but you know, like I said, everyone's going to have their own teachings that uh, affect us along the way, but that was definitely amazing. Um, 
So here I am moving to Lake County, thought I was going to be all alone, started learning about all this transition stuff, and I came back and started talking with my community. We, we had a, I just had like a community meeting with told folks about what went on in Detroit and what I was learning. And I said, we had blank butcher paper up on the walls. And it's like, what do you care about? And people were like, we care about having clean water in our community. Or like, we care about local food sovereignty. Like we want to have food justice and nobody hungry in our, in our community. Like we care about local education. And so we started doing this like community organizing. It was super grassroots, nobody telling us what to do. We just started getting the people together. And you know, using this transition model as a, a vehicle to create some of this local change. Um, one of the, and, and when you plant a seed, you know, eventually what's, what's going to happen. So we started using these transition ingredients, you know, like who, whoever had some time and space to contribute toward this movement. This picture shows actually one of the like issues, uh, like the, the, can you spot the young people, two of them, can you spot the people of color? Nope. Um, we were doing our best though, and this was, this was in like rural Lake County, people were getting together in our steering group, starting to raise awareness around some of these issues, and we used open space, and have you guys heard of open space? meeting technology. I hope you are blessed to attend an open space meeting at some point in your life. The whole point of the, the whole methodology for open space meetings is if you're doing community organizing of any kind, and this is the, you know in a decade of community organizing something that I continue to learn, it's much better to show up and listen. I'm just, I realize I'm saying a lot right now it's because I'm like that's my role right now to be speaking but usually like if you're community organizing show up and provide a vehicle for everybody else to talk. Like listen, and so open space is a way for every. We have these meetings. We had a few open space meetings in Lake County. Hundred people, hundred fifty people came to the park, and self organized. And so you brief people on the rules. Okay, if you want to host a conversation about something, start some kind of project. You take ownership over that. What do you want? What club, group, whatever conversation do you want to start today? And someone would say something like. Oh, I'm passionate about animal rights. We need a no-kill animal shelter in Lake County. And maybe two or three people will come talk to her, or a dozen. Some people will say, like, oh, we, we live on the shores of the, the largest and most, you know, the oldest and largest lake in California. We need to protect this lake. We need, some, we need to have, like, a group that's working to do something with this lake. And maybe a dozen people come to that person. And the, the, the people self-organized into these amazing groups. And what was born of these open space meetings was a time bank in Lake County where people began like building an alternative co economy, trading hour for hour instead of dollars, uh, a, a more robust community supported agriculture system, uh, and you know, creating like a local food sovereignty group. So all these, these groups emerged from using open space. So open space technology, whoever, Whoever shows up are the right people. Whatever happens is exactly what need, needs to happen. This is like the laws of life, by the way. And the law of two feet, which is important, it's that if you ever find yourself in a room or in a conversation where you're not benefiting and you're not contributing and you feel like maybe you don't want to be there, then use your two feet and go somewhere else. Because, you know, this is your precious life. You know, what are you going to do with this precious life? Um, a lot of other aspects of transition... Um, doing something, getting something done and showing it. Like one of the first things that we did was a creek cleanup, a creek cleanup because someone in our community was living on a creek and there was like tons of old appliances and other crap in the creek. And we just organized people and said, hey, you want to come clean up this creek? We filled up a huge dumpster in one day and like, it was like, all right, we're like showing that we can get things done. And, you know, whatever, you know, projects you could see happening, get people together, do it. The great reskilling I'll talk about in a minute, building a bridge to government, honoring the elders, creating an energy descent plan we never quite got around to. But ultimately, this is my favorite transition element of like, let it go where it wants to go. Get the people together, establish the community's priorities, whatever they may be, and don't feel like ownership over what needs to happen. What needs to happen will find its way. And you know, the, the key is to provide like a community vessel, like a, a context for this social change. We did evenings of community mapping, assessing what's, what resources we have access to in our community and what needs there are in the community. Who can fix a car? Who can set a bone? You know, who, like, who has the skills? Who's got the resources? Where's the food growing? Who's got land? Um, 
yeah, local arts and media. We some folks started a local rideshare group. That's just a funny little image when you ride alone, you ride with it. But you know, like you know, so it's some of these basic community solutions. Like you know, what is it, where's the rideshare group? People are driving multiple cars from the same place and mo driving multiple cars home at the end of the day. This local pine bank I told you about, local food, Lake County Community Co-op. Um, some folks spun off and started the GE Free, you know, non-GMO community group that became like a force to be reckoned with because a lot of people were passionate about keeping GMO foods off the shelves and you know having having some awareness around that. Um, also, we tried to bring music and food into pretty much every every gathering we had. We had potlucks every month. We had we brought local you know bands out to like have like you know fun sort of celebratory vibe. It's like uh, you know. If I, if if you can't, if, if there's no music, that's that's not going to be a very fun revolution anyway. So like, um, my my favorite part of the transition movement, some of my favorite experiences in the transition uh, movement that we experienced in Lake County was uh, the great reskilling, where you bring people together, and the teachers are the community members, and you find who in the community has skills and is willing to teach them, and we like arrange like days of like multiple sort of blocks of classes going on and people go and learn what, they, what they're interested in. So this guy's making paper creep, making concrete out of blocks out of paper that you can build with by like mushing up newspaper. Uh, this, these are the mushroom maestros teaching people how to grow mushrooms to eat and they were like sending people home with their own like, you know, mushroom spawns. Um, all sorts of things. Like the community is so wise. You know, classes on time banking and screen printing and yoga in the park and how to, you know, tan hides. Uh, this guy, is, Alan, was teaching us about acorns, like the indigenous human beings that lived here before the, you know, the empire came and displaced them, knew when they looked at the hill and saw the different oak trees and pine trees, like, that was food. We're surrounded by food. These oak trees are creating acorn that's like super vital as far as like a nutritional substance and all you need to do is crack them open, these little uh, garden shears are great but get their little shell off of them, make sure they're like, you know, still fresh and clean, and boil them, and pour off the water, and then boil them again, and pour off the water, and so I like to get the bitter stuff out. And then you can mush it up, you can make bread out of it, you can make meal out of it, it's just amazing stuff. So we're learning about how to live, again, music, food, always a part of it. Um, around, oh yeah, how to ferment, how to grow food, how to can food, how to do natural building, and. I mean, whatever you can imagine, we were, people were from the community were teaching it to each other. It was amazing. Um, and also around that time, I had my daughter, which changed a lot for me. Um, and started noticing a couple of the challenges in this transition towns movement. Uh, one of them we talk about is, and now I'm working with Transition US, uh, but we noticed this thing called the donut hole phenomenon, where at first you have this core group that's creating this, you know, sort of trying to map out the entire community change. And then all these projects emerge, and we're all excited about the water and doing transition streets and transportation and local food. And over time, the core kind of disintegrates. So that started happening in Lake County. And then the other thing that happened around the time my daughter was born, uh, I, the charismatic leader conundrum is like when one organizer is carrying a, a lot of the load, and then uh, life intervenes, a death in the family, a birth in the family, then and that person needs to step back, it can create a real challenge for my, my daughter's water birth. Um, that's a little Satya. Um, so when my daughter was born, I couldn't just be like, you know, a sort of freelance hippie anymore. I had to start like, you know, being a little bit more of like a conscious provider. So I went from being a part-time substitute teacher to being a full-time high school history teacher. Um, so that was, that became my world for a while, my class and their little, their little circle. I loved my class at Kelseyville High School. Um, another thing I noticed at the same time is that all roads lead back to the land because if we're living in a, a, an economy where people don't have access to the land, you know, you can organize all you want, but there's, there's a fundamental problem when we, we don't have access to the land. I was trying with some friends to create this Rainbow Ranch eco-village and we didn't own the land, we were renting the land, and ultimately were displaced from that land um, because it sold to, some, to the highest bidder, and that wasn't us. But on the land, we were doing cool things, we were growing food and coming together in community and having these amazing gatherings, and people came out for the fire and you know, honoring life together. It was pretty great. Another note from my time in Lake County, um, and this is many years ago before Standing Rock, but water is life, and that's like omnipresent, like 
to, to recognize that water is life. We started doing these healing ceremonies on the water, working with the indigenous uh, folks in Lake County. Um, I don't know if you've seen the water crystal experiments of Masaru Emoto, some like hard scientists like dismiss this as kind of woo. Uh, but this, this Japanese brother labeled water samples with different, uh, different terms or concepts, like thank you or I will kill you, and then froze the water and you know, analyze the crystals and their shapes and notice that the vibration that was put into these crystals influenced the, the shapes that they, they manifested. Just a little interesting thing, we were, living on this, we were living on this ancient lake and we started bringing people together around the water just to like honor the water and put some, some energy toward its healing. Especially because some, some really dark things have happened around here in the, in the colonial history of this country. Um, this is Clayton Duncan, he's a Pomo elder that I worked with on this, this ceremony that we did every year, Hands Around Clear Lake, um, again with music and campouts and everything. But some, some dark stuff had gone down, and one of them was the Clear Lake Massacre, and it was one of many you know, massacres that took place uh, during the colonial history of California and, and of North America and really of, of the Americas in general. Um, Clayton, that man, was the descendant of this girl. Uh, Lucy Moore, who was one of the sole survivors of this Bloody Island massacre, where the like the the conquerors came in and they wiped out an entire village of mostly women and children, and this girl and her mom survived by breathing through tule straws and hiding in the water, and they took to the hills and they lived on their own for as many weeks as they needed to until they you know were reunited with some other human beings, um, and so in addition to that healing ceremony, Clayton also led us in in forgiveness ceremonies. So to say, and to say that like the transition thing has no limits. It's not like a you know cookie cutter set of solutions. There's a bunch of you know things that we can do to be organizing our community, and each community is going to need sort of its own version of healing. Uh, oh yeah, and social justice being a, like a sacred, important part of this movement. This Martin Luther King quote: "The peace is is not merely the absence of war; it's the presence of justice." And during all of this time, during this transition organizing, like the, you know, this is like the last few years, like the, the Black Lives Matter movement becomes a thing. Like this, Naomi Klein, how, did you guys read this in this class? Or if you, if, if you get a chance, and there's also a movie now of this book, you can watch like the you know, hour and a half documentary, but this changes everything. Capitalism versus the climate. That you know, at this point where we're at with the climate crisis, like we need to change things in a hurry. And, there's no separating the climate crisis from the economic crisis and the concept of like a, an extractive economic system that's based on infinite growth. So in order to do something about the climate, we need to do something about the economy. And it was during this time in, in 2015 that I started thinking about running for United States Congress. Um, I was also hosting a community radio show and there was an interesting overlap between Transition Lake County and the community radio group because in, in rural Lake County, a bunch of little towns dotting this lake, uh, we were connected by the radio. It was like very old fashioned, kind of like frontier mentality, but everyone tuned into 88.1 FM, Lake County Community Radio. Um, and on this radio uh, program in 2014, I interviewed, I interviewed um, the man who was challenging our, our representative in Congress. And it kind of like planted a seed in me because like he, ended, he didn't end up winning, but he ended up doing okay. And I, I was like, wow, well, I feel like really educated about the issues, really passionate, and like I could maybe pull this off. And so I went to DC and I, I like asked myself, do I want to do this? I went and like met my congressman who's been doing the job for almost 20 years and we're still where we were 20 years ago, only maybe a little bit worse. Uh, and I, I, I sat with, you know, the, with the masters, with Abe Lincoln and Dr. King, and in the middle of the night, I was sitting at the Lincoln Monument, and a fox came out and like, ran across the plaza. And I was like, all right, I'll take that as a sign. And I decided to do it. And then two days after deciding to do it, Bernie Sanders announced that he was running for president. And this, at the time, no one knew who this dude was. Um, but I was, I was tuned into Bernie, and I decided to, to run for Congress. Um, and then it was the other crazy thing that happened. So I was, I, was a, I was elected to be a Bernie delegate in that, that run up to the 2016 election. I was running for Congress on a similar thing. At the same time, Transition US, which is the national nonprofit hub of the Transition Towns movement, hired me to be their communications coordinator. 
Um, so I had gone from being like a local grassroots organizer of transition to like now working with the National Hub, which you guys is in Sebastopol. So there's like, there's an international transition towns movement of like going on in 50 countries, you know, thousands of towns around the world. There's 160 plus transition towns in the US and Transition US is headquartered in Sonoma County. Pretty far out. So they hired me. I started working with these transition organizers around the country, like kind of mapping out the, you know, getting a sense of where the movement's at and like sharing knowledge and resources among other community organizers, trying to like, trying to bring transition into the light. We're a super tiny nonprofit based on this like really awesome model of community organizing. And it's not a household name yet. Like people know that global warming's a thing. Everyone knows that. People are buying Priuses. We don't quite know about transition yet. So like I'm trying to bring some like visibility to transition. Um, awesome solutions happening in the community. And around the same time, the Valley Fire happened. And this was, this was you know, two years before the fire that happened here in Sonoma County. This was the Big Lake County fires, but it actually displaced me from my home. And I, during that time, I was thinking about running for Congress, and then the fire came, and I, I wasn't thinking about running for Congress. I was thinking about what are we going to do you know, for our people right now during this crisis. Um, a lot of our work, this was Middletown that got devastated, a lot of our work in community was at the radio station getting resources where they needed to go and using the radio as like a method of like uh, transmitting information and healing. And I started noticing these overlaps between our work in community resilience, the transition stuff, building local, you know, local food resilience where we had food growing in Lake County, building up a local community and, and economy where we knew each other and knew our neighbors. Like, that was emergency preparedness work and we didn't even know it at the time. This is my backyard. My house didn't burn down, but I was renting. So like the fire kissed the house I was living in and my landlords decided to sell it. So I was out. Uh, this was me at the radio station the night of the fire. So like I was displaced by the fire and evacuated. And it was like the mountain was burning down. I had to like drive toward the fire for a minute to rescue my buddy Craig and then turned around and like got down to safety and tuned into the radio station and it was playing a rerun because the lady who was supposed to be in there was caught up in the fire too. So me and my hippie buddies drove down to the radio station and we like took over the station and started this community coverage of the crisis that like ended up pe other people came in and like it was the thing like people were listening to the radio to find out like what roads were closed and what was happening with the schools and what where do we go tonight and what's needed at the shelters and how can I help. Uh, we were, this was from the LA Times, like this radio station, what we did at the radio was featured in the BBC and international media, it was, it was, it was amazing. Um, lots of people, these are my buddies, they, their home burned down. This is us at a, one of the shelters, playing at Uno. Like this woman lost her home, a lot of, like a lot of people lost their homes, similar to here in Sonoma County. The, at the time, the Valley Fire was the second most destructive wildfire in California history. Um, also interesting how like, even, even after a crisis like that, like we kind of depended on like this fossil fuel based imperial sort of like, you know, FEMA needs to come over the hill and rescue us. But we still, we still did have our community resilience. I did end up deciding to run for Congress that year. It was like a, a, a few months after the fire, after the fires were put out and I got back into my place where I was still able to be a renter for another couple months. Um, I, I spent a night up online late clicking around on the Federal Election Commission website. And that's the, the federal entity that tracks where political candidates get their money from. And I started noticing that our Democrat, as, as well as the Republicans and all, you know, Democrats, they were all getting tremendous amounts of money from the same huge mega corporations, fossil fuel companies, military industrial giants, weapons manufacturers, too big to fail banks, like all of them were feeding our politicians. So I decided to run. Also, meanwhile, noticing my place in the global transition movement. It's happening everywhere. It was crazy. Um, I'm not like emphasizing the, the Congress thing. I'm emphasizing the transition towns movement. Solutions on all of the things of life. And it's like the transition movement is a toolkit of ideas for addressing the energy crisis, for addressing local food, producing our own food. 
for increasing the water supply and caring for our watersheds. Like catching rainwater and storing it. Like in California, we don't have a water shortage. We have a water storage shortage because the water comes down and then washes right out so we can catch the water. <clears throat> Transportation, getting out of our cars, doing things like the village building convergence movement where people are like redesigning communities to be more walkable. Local economy, not only creating green jobs, but having things like tool libraries and fix-it fairs where people come together and fix stuff. This is from, uh, from England in the town of Brixton. They created their own pounds and like just for fun, like put David Bowie on the, on the currency. So solutions abounding, reskilling, like I talked about earlier, inner transition, you know, like cultivating a, a community, you know, and personal inner, inner resilience, whatever that looks like for, for a person. So many other aspects, emergency preparedness, we're talking about more and more transition US nowadays is like more climate related crises or displacing people around the world. Healthcare, education, elders, youth, really again, whatever the community is needing. One of my favorite uh, transition success stories is the repair cafe model, which this is in Pasadena, but now it's happening all over the place. You can like search for repair cafes and they're happening all over the place where instead of throwing stuff in a landfill when your toaster stops working, we have like a day, this community will have a day where everybody comes together, meets up at the high school, talented, often old people who like know how to take things apart and fix them, will teach the youth how to do it. And instead of having to throw your blender in a landfill, you get it fixed in community. So, and there's this great quote uh, from the one in Pasadena. I can't believe that someone who worked on the Mars rover just fixed my toaster. Another fun success story in Kentucky, they're doing the Sustainable Berea Kentucky uh, project where they did a Victory Garden Blitz, installed 169 garden beds in four days. So now like you can walk down the street and just like pick some edible food on your way home and it's all public for anybody. Um, this coal miner actually sent us an email last year and he was talking about how the transition movement like inspired him to quit his job as a coal miner and like become like a, a community resilience uh, builder and he ended up like writing a book about it and going around and giving lectures to well, any community in Kentucky that would listen to him and like spreading the word of like sustainability and community resilience. In Media, Pennsylvania, they got an awesome time bank. They're getting solar energy installed all over the place. And they have this thing called the free store, which is so cool. It's kind of like a thrift shop, but everything's free. So they somehow they got storefront space and people bring things they don't need anymore and people come get things that they do need. And it's, it, it's like, you know, kind of flipping the economy on its head a little bit, like creating a gift economy where we're sharing the resources. Again, no, no limit to what it could be. Creating green energy infrastructure, taking back public space, you know, painting murals. This, I think that photo is from Portland, but they're doing this in Ashland. And in Sebastopol, they do village building convergences where they, they take back intersections like this. Obviously, like, important to be teaching the next generation how to, how to grow food going on all over the world. After the Fukushima disaster in Japan, Transition Japan uh, initiatives have been really instrumental in getting alternative energy infrastructure installed in these towns in Japan, so they're not relying on, on nuclear plants that could be you know, blown up by, uh, by tsunamis. Uh, in Brazil, where water, water access is a real challenge, folks are doing rainwater catchment and teaching, teaching how to uh, catch rainwater and store it. Transition in South Africa, transition in Croatia. Last year I was blessed to go to the International Transition uh, Conference in Italy and I met with people doing transition from all around the world. It was like building solidarity and learning from people who are doing transition in Brazil, in Argentina, in Japan. It was amazing. Transition is getting a little bit more cultural play, like this movie, which I totally recommend, it just came out last year, it's called Demain, it's a French movie, but a lot of it's in English, so you can find it as tomorrow or tomorrow-documentary.com, I'll write on the board before you take off, but I totally recommend it, it's talking about the solutions that are happening all around the planet to, you know, it's, a, it's like upbeat, like they're actual solutions to these crises that we face. Um, and the transition movement continues. The Transition Streets program is like now bringing people together with like other people in their community. Like you can have this Transition Streets program where you get your neighbors together, even if you're a renter, and like talk about 
you know, our, w w what's going on with our water consumption, energy consumption, with our waste, and start making plans to actually transform things, for, like household by household. Um, we're also about to implement this new uh, emergency preparedness handbook curriculum where people can like meet with neighbors and figure out how prepared we are for the, uh, the unexpected. Uh, transitions involved in advocacy, this is from COP21, uh, the Paris Climate Agreements, but Transition was involved in that as well. Uh, there's now a how to do transition on your university campus guide, so if you're inspired, I can get you more information about that, but you know, people are transitioning their universities. Uh, we just had our very first national gathering in St. Paul, so you know these 160 transition towns, many of them sent delegates to, to meet together in the summer in uh, Minnesota, and it was amazing, this was this past summer. And uh, we have got our next one now in the works for Pittsburgh for 2019. Um, and there's a lot of great videos from that as well at transitiongathering.org. We can see a lot of the, like, the lect lectures and workshops from that. Um, and the other thing is like, noticing that the universe is fractal and relational and that like it's kind of like when you look at the universe you, it, it looks very much like when you look at a cell you know like there's a lot of similarities between the human cell and the body or between a galaxy and an atom and so in the transition movement it was just like in a little transition town there's like a core group and there's little working groups that are doing things but now there's bioregional transition groups that are coming together like transition northern california that's bringing together all the different transition groups in northern california or like a you know transition hub for new england and you know working on transition national working groups that are working on you know food projects around the entire country so there's more grassroots leadership emerging in the national structure also, this is from last year, this date, so it's not this exact date, but if you do live in this area and you're curious about the kinds of things that I'm talking about, I would strongly recommend or I would like lovingly invite you to come to the, the Permaculture Convergence, which is at the Solar Living Institute in Hopland every fall. I think it's going to be at the end of September this year, but it's great. It's like multiple days of gathering. People, like some folks, camp out and, you know, learn natural building and learn transition related permaculture related things there's workshops in on everything from like you know creating uh, new economies to you know I, I mean anything that you could really imagine in the vein of permaculture growing food growing soil uh, decolonizing our movement like all of these issues come up at the, the convergences they're really great um, so I'll share the website for that if anything, I, I want to hold a little bit of space for questions if you've got them. If any of this is inspiring you at all, we're always interested in taking on interns. We can get a lot of people like college credit for helping out with transition. So if you're curious and want to pitch in, if you're totally invited. Um, I just I'll give you my information to get in touch. Uh, before I conclude, just another quick lineage check. And like, you know, if I could assign homework, I would say like, you know, chart out your own lineage of like the moments that have like helped to wake you up on your personal path or the personal events that you've gone through, the teachers you've studied from, the like historical figures you've looked up to, and like honor that lineage and then ask the question of like what's next for me, what's, what's next for you personally. Um, as always, like if you're not into transition, whatever, like you've got your own personal song to sing and it's not even about what the world needs as much as what will make you come alive because that's what the world needs right now is people who have come alive. So like the thing that, that moves your soul, like that's what you're here to do. And so with that, I just like, I want to uplift whatever your unique song is on this planet that you sing it before you die. Uh, yeah. <laughs> above all, right? This above all to thine own self be true. So just, just one, one human being thanking you for sharing your time. Uh, I've got some resources here. You can always check out transitionus.org if you're curious to learn more about the Transition Towns movement and where it's going on. There's a lot of towns locally that are doing transition here. Um, the Permaculture Convergence that I mentioned in Hopland, permacultureconvergence.com. Um, I I've, I've, I've sort of downplayed the Congress thing. I ran in 2016. Uh, I came in third in the primary in 2016. And the sec it's like a top two, right? Kind of like the governor's race and all these other ones. The top two in June make it into November. So in, in 2016, I came in third in the primary and second place went to a Republican. This year, I am running again and I'm running as an independent candidate for the people and there is in the primary race there is actually isn't a Republican there's our, our 10 term Democratic incumbent who's got lots of like corporate funds and then there's a few you know sort of people's challengers and I'm like I'm, I'm coming at this from the standpoint of 
deep radical solidarity with all human beings and life on this planet and the seventh generation. So I'm running again. I didn't want to spend too much time during this lecture talking about it, but if you're curious, I put my website up there, nilsforcongress.com. I'd be glad to speak with you about that more as well. And uh, you can email me, nils at transitionus.org, and I've got my number here for y'all if you're curious. Um, I also, I guess if, if you would like, while I take uh, any questions, I'll send this around. Totally optional if you feel like signing up for emails. I can hit you up with more information uh, from transition or from my, my personal world of, of service and organizing. Uh, and I think, yeah, that's it. I just, you know, much gratitude to all y'all for sharing your time with me. Really honored to be here with you today. So thank you. Thank you for receiving that like download. Oh yeah, and Phoenix, thank you for welcoming Phoenix as well. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know what our time container is exactly like, but if you have any questions, I would be more than honored to answer them, um, or or like personal comments too, like how this is landing. With you. Yeah, brother. You were gonna say something about your um, your, your dress. Your oh yeah, totally. Right. Uh, thank you for bringing me back to that. Well, I don't know. Uh, I, I guess part of it is that I am recognizing the privilege and like recognizing like the, my white privilege, my university educated privilege, and wanting to use that in a subversive way. So like I want to be creating systems that are honoring all life, honoring all, you know, all people, all colors, all genders, everything. And at the same time, I, I am university educated. I am a white man. And like at the end of the day, honestly, like, I want, I want to be electing to power women of color. Like, that's who I follow. And at the same time, I'm, I'm, I'm attempting to use my, my, the position that I've been placed in culturally to use that in a way that, that creates liberation for all. So, like, I'm, that's why I'm running, part of why I'm running for Congress is to create liberation and justice for all. And, like, instead of wearing, like, hippie garb and, like, going around dressed like Aladdin, like, I'm, I'm like, no, I'm, I'm dressing, I'm dressing the part. So that's... I didn't. Thank you for bringing me back to that uh, little tangent that I could have gone on. Yeah. So are you still in Lake County? I moved out of Lake County after the fire, so I lost my place, and uh, I was working. I started. I had started working at Transition US in Sebastopol, mm -hmm. and meanwhile, my daughter's mother was starting to attend school here. She's in the, uh, just about to graduate, actually, next week from from Sonoma State. So, if you ever walk by the children's school right out there, okay. my daughter's been going to preschool there for two years. Okay. So yeah, I moved. I ended up moving here just because it was more like in, in flow for me. So I live in Santa Rosa now, and our congressional district. I don't know where. So I know some people in this program. Last I was talking here last year, and someone was like, "Yeah, I live in Florida or something like that," um, or maybe it was San Diego. I was a sister from San Diego, but you know, our district here goes from Santa Rosa and Rohnert Park and Katati all the way out through Napa to like Vallejo and Benicia, and then up to Southern Lake County. It's a huge piece of land. Well, it was hard to leave my students for sure, um, but I, I, it was like, if, if a person can behold a greater good by leaving behind a lesser good, like go for the greater. And so like I, I it was hard, but it wasn't because I, I felt like I was being called to do something else. So like I had this high school offering me a full time teaching job. And at the same time, I was like, oh, I like I need to be doing something like to be a good teacher, I don't know if any of you are like planning to be a teacher, but like to be a good teacher, and this man could probably testify to it, like you gotta spend time designing curriculum. You gotta be there like every day, like showing up. That's gotta be your passion. And I was finding myself like much more like passionate about creating like deep social change. Like I want to co create a government that is of by and for the people, that's like enacting earth care and people care and fair share into our so like I <laughs> I mean, it could it could happen in school if that's the way that, but that wasn't the, the, the groove that I wanted to groove. I would have been like a distracted teacher who was like thinking about other stuff. And like, I even noticed that when I was like subbing sometimes, like I was like, you know, writing about stuff instead of like putting myself totally into the project of teaching. So, and I actually, I still do teach. Now I teach adults. I teach anatomy and physiology at, a, at the World School in San Francisco. And I take every opportunity I can to like guest lecture at places like this and do workshops, like at the Permaculture Convergence, I do workshops there and stuff too. Is Thompson and Santa just leaving Congress? Well, he's, yeah, so thank you for <laughs> phrasing it that way. He, he, he's running again, but yes, he is. Oh, he is he, again. Yeah, but he is. Oh, well, he's, he's running this year. 
Um, there is scuttle that he's planning to retire, but there's yeah. also like scuttle it's that being, he's. It's being seriously talked about. It's being talked about that he's already already designated his like rich white man replacement. So like I'm I'm like again hoping that we can have like a you know someone of the people in there. Yeah. This transition about about creating permaculture in the communities and transition Transition was born of permaculture, and I would say it's like it's about it's a it's about applying the permaculture principles to designing our communities instead of just like looking at our farm or our landscape. It's like looking at our town, like our town is the garden, and so if you're like a gardener or a farmer or a homesteader, you look at your the piece of land and like where's the sunlight shining, where's the water flowing, like where does the wildlife walk through, like what does the land want to produce, what is the soil like. So similarly with transition, we look at our entire community and like what are the energy vectors? Like what are the groups of people? What do the people need? Where's the water? Where's the food? Um, so kind of applying that permaculture lens to our entire project of living together in community. Yeah. So a lot of people are doing transition and don't, do, don't know permaculture. And the other cool thing is that with like blessed unrest, if you saw that, like a lot of people are doing transition without even knowing it because the transition movement is pretty like minimally known at this moment, but people are growing local food all over the place. You know, people are like becoming hip to like the need to like do grassroots community organizing all over the place. So I, I like to say that transition by any other name is just as sweet, you know, like much like a rose, like you call it what you want. Transition with a big T, transition with a little T, you know, call it changing our communities and making things more awesome, call it what you want. But it's happening everywhere for sure. Other thoughts or questions? Cool. <laughs> okay, well, I'll, I'll, those of you who signed up, I'll send you an email. You can write me anytime and I'll, you know, feel free to hang out if you want to get you know, my card or whatever. But super glad to meet you all and grateful to be here with you. And thanks for sharing space with me today. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks. And uh, we got my <laughs> Excellent. <laughs>